Come on, Dave. Amen. Uh, please uh, be turning your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It is Father's Day, and I know some of you that didn't get a bag, you're like, I wonder what's in there. So first of all, uh, I want to thank Mary for these amazing bags and putting this together for the dads. And so we've got uh, Mr. Goodbar. Hopefully, we'll all be good fathers. Uh, and then we've got uh, some more candies here. We've got Dad's Little Barrel Root Beer candies. And then we've got uh, Sugar Daddies. I'm definitely saving that one. Oh, and we got some Hershey's Kisses. And then we got the Big Daddy Size Old Fashioned Root Beer. Uh, oh, Dad's old fashioned root beer. <laughs> but it's the big daddy side. I like that. That's awesome. Thank you again, Mary, for putting that together. Okay, so if uh, you're visiting, we've been doing a series called uh, Adventures in Love because, you know, we can never preach too much on love. Uh, but it is the summertime, and uh, we like adventure, too. So Adventures in Love. And because it is Father's Day and I am a father, uh, I decided that uh, the adventure that we're going to go on is my adventure. And so uh, here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 15, Paul writes, Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. You know, uh, as we follow Christ, there are people that come into our lives that uh, can be father figures spiritually. Uh, obviously, there's only one father in heaven, and we do not want to dishonor him. But the Holy Spirit put this on Paul's heart uh, to say that he was a father spiritually for these people. And uh, I believe for myself... You know, uh, growing up, um, at the age of 10, uh, my dad and my mom got divorced, and I, I really didn't see my dad again until I was in my 30s. And so, not really knowing I was doing this, I was always seeking out father figures um, subconsciously, and, uh, you know, I needed that in my life, someone that was going to uh, guide me. And so, uh, I'd like us to go through Psalm chapter 1 today, the uh, main text uh, is Psalm chapter 1. There are six verses, and I uh, broke it down into uh, three points to make it easy for us, um, for me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> now, there's been a, a lot of father figures in my life, but I, I'm just going to choose three. And so I have three uh, uh, points. And so uh, from Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, I come up with my first father figure. In verse 1, it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. And so uh, my first father figure uh, I met him when I was 15. His name was Jeff Harmon. And so my, la my dad left when I was 10, and he was the disciplinarian. And my mom couldn't speak English that well. And so she was going to school to learn how to speak English, and she had two jobs. And so I kind of started raising myself with no discipline. And so you can imagine what I was like by the time I was 15. I was a mess. Uh, stealing cars, uh, selling drugs, uh, getting kicked out of high school. Uh, but my mom, one of her jobs was uh, she did uh, computer work. There was this new invention called the computer. And, uh, and so she did computer work. She could type really, really fast. And so they hired her to uh, do this computer work at a local health club. And so she would get me summer jobs at this health club. And so I met Jeff Harmon, who was... Uh, five or six old uh, years older than me, but he was like a father figure, like an older brother, father figure to me. Um, uh, and, I, and I got to hang out with him during the summertime. And then um, 
And so that was 1981 uh, when I met him, uh, age 15. And then uh, in 1986, I, uh, he became like the manager. He was like the big wig uh, in, in, in the company. And I uh, worked for him, under him, and I, I learned how to uh, work in the health club industry at a different level. Um, but as it says here, uh, you don't want to stand uh, with sinners or uh, with the wicked, but that was me and that was Jeff as well. I don't want to throw Jeff under uh, the bus, but uh, hey, we're all sinners. Um, and I love him dearly, him and his whole family. And so at that time, uh, I just did what he did. And, uh, you know, even though we worked in a health club, we'd go in the back alley and we'd smoke cigarettes and talk. And, uh, and I just listened to everything he had to say. And then uh, we'd work from eight or nine in the morning till nine or 10 at night. And he was a workaholic, even though he was married, he didn't really want to go home and be with his wife. He just wanted to be at work all the time. And, uh, and so I became a, a workaholic. And uh, then at night we'd go to a little Italian place right next door and we just order pitchers and pitchers of beer. And so we'd basically go home drunk. And so I was smoking, drinking, working uh, a lot of hours. Uh, and then uh, we started, uh, when I turned 18, he took me to my first strip club. And so then I got into uh, all kinds of just uh, nasty stuff. And this was, this was my life. And uh, it just got perpetually worse. And then I didn't see him for years, for like four or five years. And he called me up in 1992 and uh, he uh, offers me a job. And I cursed him out because I had let him borrow money like four or five years prior and he had forgotten. And I was like, you owe me money. And uh, usually he would have just attacked back. I was waiting for it. And instead he apologized and said, uh, why don't you come pick up your money? And, uh, and so I went just out of curiosity if he was actually gonna hand me the money. And he did. And, uh, and, then, and then I was like, hey, can I still have that job? <laughs> And so here, here it is, it's January, 1993. And, and he's hanging out with his wife and they're happy. Like, what is going on? And then, and then I saw him in the aerobic studio doing a Bible study with one of the members. I'm like, I don't wanna hang out with this guy. Like in my head, I'm like, this guy's turned weird, you know? But he was happy. He was rejoicing in the law of the Lord, right? And so he invites me to church. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll meet you there. Uh, I wasn't gonna go. Um, but he's like, uh, I'll pick you up. Uh, oh. <laughs> and uh, Jeff is six foot five, 300 pounds, solid muscle. And so God knew who it was gonna take to get me <laughs> to church. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I decided that I would get so drunk that night that he wouldn't be able to wake me up. And that's, that was my big plan. And so I, I go to uh, a place where they serve alcohol. I had no, you know, just the closest place, boom. And just start drinking as much as I could. And um, uh, I ended up buying drugs that night. I was so drunk, I bought drugs that kept me up all night. And so now I'm hungover and I'm on speed. And now, so now he picks me up and you know, I'm, I'm gonna go to church. And so I go to the church and it was just like this, all different races, all different ages. And I was not used to that because my mom would make me go to church and I only went because I could borrow the car. And so when I went to church with her, it was either an all black church or an all Mexican church or all white church or an all old church, you know? Um, and this was different. And everyone was fired up to sing songs uh, and I'm like, okay, there's something going on here. Everyone seems higher than I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> but he got me a Bible. He said, here, I got you a Bible. And I want you to start reading in the book of John. And so I started reading. And he gave me a highlighter and a pen. And he goes, just underline the stuff that hits you and highlight the stuff that hits you. And, you know, within a few months, the whole Bible was just all highlighted. I was like, man, this is amazing. And so my first point comes from uh, this uh, psalm, rejoice in the law of the Lord. For me, Jeff taught me how to rejoice in the law of the Lord. Uh, I learned what blessed means. 
Uh, I thought blessed meant if you drive a big fat Mercedes. Thank you. And uh, you uh, have a, a nice Rolex and a girl under your arm, then you're blessed. But that's not what it means. Blessed just means super happy. And it's like a supernatural happiness that only God can give you. And I didn't know that. And so uh, as I read the scriptures, it started happening to me, just like him, how happy he was uh, to read his Bible and to walk the way he was walking. I wanted that same peace and joy in my life. And it started happening just from reading the Bible. Uh, look over in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, this is also... Uh, uh, a scripture that I memorized, and it was easy because it was 2T2, two, 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 2 Timothy 2.22. 2, and so uh, it was one of the first scriptures I memorized. And the reason I was asked to memorize it was because just how immature I was. Uh, even though I was 26, I still acted like a 13-year-old, a 12-year-old. And in verse 22, it says, flee the evil desires of youth. And, uh, and so he was trying to teach me, don't be that way. But instead, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And so I learned that, how important it was to hang out with other people that are also pursuing righteousness, pursuing peace, pursuing love, uh, and going after their relationship with God in the Bible. And so it wasn't just a Sunday thing. It was like, hey, I want to hang out with people every day that do this. And so I learned that very quickly. And then uh, that same year in 93, so 93, uh, I got, uh, I studied the Bible uh, starting uh, Jan January 31st, and I got baptized February 28th, and I began uh, my relationship there and got uh, with God in 93, just rejoicing in the law of the Lord. And I started really just getting involved with what the church was doing. And I went to a, a singles devotional and, uh, and so they taught scriptures, and the one I remember is uh, Proverbs 13, 4. It says, the hands of the diligent are fully satisfied. And uh, uh, he who finds a wife finds what is good. I was like, so I can go after finding a wife? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so in 93, I met Jill. And, uh, oh and so, yeah. Oh and so June uh, 30th, we'll be celebrating our 28th. 27th anniversary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, somewhere around there. Um, but, you know, I learned you got to be diligent. Uh, you know, it's not a matter of just waiting for God, just let God. No, no, you go after it. You pursue God. You pursue those things uh, uh, with all your heart. And so, you know, uh, we ended up getting married. And highlighting the Bible and underlining things, not so much anymore. Uh, and so I started to drift from my relationship with God. And uh, I started replacing the Bible with books that Christians had written. They were called DPI books. And so my relationship with God and the power of God transferred over to the power of what someone said in a book. And so my, my relationship with God started to wane. And uh, I was no longer rejoicing in the law of the Lord. And so I got to ask you, how's it going? Are you rejoicing in the law of the Lord? Are you still fired up after 28 years of walking with God and highlighting scriptures? I'm, oh, man, that is amazing. I still love that now that I understand how important it is. But for my wife and I, uh, we both, we started, we started drifting. And, uh, and so I just want to give you a little challenge. Uh, before we get to the next phase of my life, which includes Jill, um, at the end of verse two, it says, happy is the one who meditates on his law all the day and the night. And so, you know, we talk about getting up in the morning and reading our Bible and making that a priority. But how about at night before you go to bed? Uh, it's going to help you. And so why don't you challenge yourself this week? Not only read the Bible in the morning, but how about before you go to bed at night, uh, let's, uh, let's meditate on his law. Amen? Amen? Okay, so 2003, 10 years later, um, Jill and I stopped going to church. The church was, uh, uh, you know, a mess in Jesus. And uh, we decided, you know, it's not for us. And we walked away, kind of got kicked out, kind of like in high school. 
uh, got kicked out of high school, got kicked out of the church. And uh, within uh, three years, by 2005, Jill and I started talking about getting a divorce. And it was a uh, sober, like, you know, when you get to the point where you don't even yell at each other, you just, I think we ran our course. And I did not want to do that. And so I, I prayed for the first time in three years and it was just help me with, te with just tears. Just help me, God. And I realized how far I had drifted. Um, and, and so uh, I started going back to church, trying to find a group of people that were rejoicing in the law of the Lord. You know what I'm talking about? Like they were like, it, it, would, it would be evident that this is their life. And uh, I just couldn't find it. Um, and Jill was uh, actually going through the Yellow Pages. There was this book back in the day called The Yellow Pages. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so she started going through the book to find, uh, see if there was any, you know, people that were uh, sold out disciples. We just couldn't find any. And then uh, Jill uh, said, hey, we're going on a family vacation. We're going up to Portland to visit family. So her mom and dad, my in-laws live in Portland. And I had heard from a friend that there was a leader up there that was uh, a church leader that I could talk to to find out what happened. His name was uh, Kit McKean. And, uh, and so I walked into his church and I just sat in the back with folded arms and uh, they were all excited. It was uh, about 300 people and they were singing with all their heart. And it was just like I remembered the first time I went to church and saw this group of people. And at the end, uh, people started lining up and getting baptized. And I didn't know who these people were, but I just started, I just started crying. Like, oh my gosh, people are coming to the Lord. And I was just in tears. I was overwhelmed because it had been like seven years since I had witnessed that. And so here in Psalm chapter one, um, you see in verse three, happy is the man says that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither whatever they do prospers and so I, I asked him if we could go to lunch this guy Kip and I wasn't seeking a father figure from him I just wanted some answers like because he he was part of the leadership group of the church I was part of down in LA where Jill and I lived. And I was like, what happened? Like, why did it just fall apart? And yet I see it different up here in Portland. And uh, he just shared with me that uh, he had, he had sinned out in LA. He had treated people harshly. And uh, he, there's a scripture in Thessalonians where it says, uh, you encourage the timid, you help the weak and uh, you, rebuke the idol but he just rebuked everyone and uh didn't help the weak and and he said and god had to humble him and help him understand um how he had blown it and he said i'm, I'm never going to do that again i'm gonna i'm gonna start over and so uh i had uh i had asked a friend who was part of uh, another church close to uh, where we lived and they didn't have any leadership there. And I said, Hey, do you want me to ask Kip uh, to help you out? I'm going to go meet with him. I have an appointment. And um, he's like, no, Kip's just going to tell us to bear fruit. And he goes, I don't want to talk to Kip. And it didn't, it didn't, I didn't understand that at first, but as any good father, you tell your son, brush your teeth. You tell your daughter, go to the dentist. Uh, don't eat so much candy. Why? Because you want to take care of their teeth, right? And so the kid might not understand, why can't I have that extra piece of pie? But the father knows what's best. And so as I look back now, I go, okay, it makes sense that Kip would focus on baptisms. Because it says here that happy is the one who yields its fruit in season. <laughs> And so imagine the last time you invited someone to church and they studied the Bible and you baptized them. Imagine that feeling. I mean, it's an amazing feeling to have that. And so, as of course, as a dad, you want that for your children. You want your father, your children to experience that kind of happiness, that kind of joy 
Uh, look over in Daniel chapter 12. You know, um, at the end of verse 3 there, it says, whatever they do prospers. Up here, you know, we say where God makes dreams come true. <laughs> that is when you seek your, uh, uh, your will to be God's will. When your will seeks to be God's will, then he allows you to prosper in everything that you do. And so you want your children to prosper in everything that they do. In Daniel chapter 12, he, uh, he talks about the future of what's going to happen in the last days. And um, it can be an exciting thought or it can be a scary thought, depending on what side you land on. In verse 1, it says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. <laughs> Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise or uh, better translated, who impart wisdom, those who impart wisdom will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. See, I don't really care if my kids get a degree and become a doctor, a dentist, whatever. That really isn't a priority for me. My priority for them, my wish for them is that they shine forever and ever. That's my priority. Uh, I don't care if, uh, you know, they're great basketball players or baseball players and uh, make $30 million a year. I don't care about that stuff. All I care about is that they don't fall on the side of shame and contempt. Because those are the only two sides. Shame and contempt or leading many people to wisdom and to righteousness. Those are your two choices. And so, of course, Kip's an amazing father in the faith because that's what he stresses. He wants us to make it to heaven. And if that is not your will, you're not going to make it. It doesn't matter what church you go to. It doesn't matter where you're sitting this morning. What matters is your will, the Father's will. Because you're either going to rise up in the last days with shame and contempt because you lived your life for yourself or to everlasting glory with God because you help many come to righteousness. Look over in Luke chapter 9. I called uh, Levi last night, asked him if I could share this. Uh, Levi's been studying the Bible. And um, he's an amazing man. I told him to much has been given, much is expected. And uh, he's a sharp, sharp young man. And so, um, you yeah. know. He, he's got to have that embedded in his head that God expects a lot from him. Yeah. There's a lot of sharp people in this room. Uh, in verse 23 of Luke chapter 9, it says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it? For someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. And so we read this scripture about being a disciple, being someone who goes out and shares the Bible and helps people. And I said, how do you feel about doing that? He's like, ah, I don't know. Uh, what's your concern? Well, my friends are going to think I'm weird. Uh, is that is that it? Yeah, that's it. I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, let's turn over to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. In John 15, verse 18, it says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. 
As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. People ridiculing you is nothing. If that's all you're getting, then, then you're not taking this seriously. Uh, when you share the amount of love that God lavished on you, people are going to hate you. It doesn't matter if you serve them, if you fed them, if you help them. Uh, there's going to come a time where they're either going to become like Jesus or they're going to hate you because of who you represent. And they don't even know that, that they're doing it. They think they're doing it for God. That's what Jesus says is going to happen. And so I said, Levi, you have two choices. You can either live in mediocrity like the rest of the world, or you can be radical like Jesus. When you decide to live radical like Jesus, people are going to hate you. It's not going to be just, you know, they're, they're going to make me feel funny. No, they're going to hate you. They killed Jesus. Uh, and that's what's going to happen when you actually try to help people and you bring them into uh, the, the word of God, they're going to react that way. And uh, I said, so what do you think? And he was like uh, <laughs> that uh, man who had the paralyzed son. He said, I believe, but help me believe. And so we looked at what it takes to have faith. And in Romans 10, 17 it says faith comes from hearing the message and i said this once a week stuff isn't enough for you you need twice a week and so he's agreed i want to study twice a week now and so he wants to be radical but he needs faith and that's what we all need right and so you gotta ask yourself when's the last time you brought a friend to church when's the last time you studied the bible with a, a neighbor a friend a co-worker <laughs> were you even in a bible study this last week you need faith you need to rejoice in the law of the lord you need to meditate in the morning and at night get your faith up there and then just share your faith uh, you know, I've been doing this for 20 plus years, except for those three years there in, in between. Uh, and I still get a little scared. And so Jill uh, and I joined this gym. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I want to share my faith there. Um, and so the way I overcome my fear is I find the biggest, baddest dude. And, and, and so that's the guy I share with first. If I can share with the biggest, scariest dude first, then okay, the rest is easy. And so maybe that's what you need to do. You need to figure out who's the most terrifying person in your life and just share your faith with them. And it'll just get you going and, you, and then you just won't stop. But you've got to make sure that you're sharing your faith. Happy is the man that is bearing fruit. That's my second point. Now, a few, a few of you are doing that. You're out there, you're bringing people to church, and uh, you're getting into Bible studies. And on behalf of those few that are doing that uh, with me, I want to close with this challenge. Come on. Won't you join us today? Come on. Won't you join us today? You got to rejoice in the law of the Lord. Meditate on his law all the day and the night because happy is the man by the stream. You know what a stream does? It moves. It's moving. It's constantly moving. You got to be part of a movement. We're not just trying to evangelize Syracuse. We want to move out into Albany. We want to move out into Rochester. We want to move. We got to keep moving. We got to be part of a stream. We can't just be a local church. See, when you're part of the stream, then you're going to be happy and you're going to bear fruit in season. And so come on, won't you join us today? So my two fathers, Jeff Harmon, brought me to the Lord. Kip helped me get focused again and uh, brought joy to my wife and I's life. Um, I appreciated his humility and his willingness to share his sins. Uh, that's got to be us as well. Uh, we got to share our weaknesses and because, uh, you know, we're no better than anybody else. Uh, we are all sinners. Uh, and that leads me to my last point, Psalm chapter one. Let's go back there. Verse four, 
Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. My final point is our God, like chaff, blows the wicked away. And that's my final father. It's our God, our Father in heaven. And it says here that uh, he will blow the wicked away like chaff. And uh, you find that phrase all throughout the Old Testament. He says there's going to come a time when uh, the chaff will be blown away. Uh, and so I had to research that, what chaff was. And so basically, uh, if you go into a wheat field and you gather the harvest to get to the wheat, you have to put pressure and uh, get that little kernel out. And so uh, we come together, we look at the scriptures. Some of you are feeling pressure like, oh man, I need to go share with my boss now. You know, so <laughs> you guys are feeling it. It's the Holy Spirit, it's the word of God that's, that's doing that, right? You're feeling that, but it's, it's just the same thing. And so you feel this little pressure on the wheat. And then what they would do is they would take a big winnowing fork and they take that and they would throw it up into the air and the kernels, the real stuff, the real Jesuses fall where the fake Jesuses blow away. The chaff blows away with the wicked. And then it, it burns up. Look over in uh, Matthew chapter 3. You know, Jesus, he takes the whole Old Testament, all 600 laws, the Ten Commandments and the 600 laws, and he brings it down to one word, and that's love. Because if you love you're not going to commit adultery. If you love, you're not going to steal. If you love, you're not going to murder. You're not going to do those things. And so he brings it to love. And he teaches us how to love. And the way you do that is to be like him. It says here um, in Matthew chapter 3. And so this, this is uh, the winnowing fork and the chaff in the New Testament is only in there twice. But it's the same story. You'll find it in Matthew three and in Luke three, but here we'll read in Matthew three um, in verse 11. It's John the Baptist describing Jesus. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barns and burning up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. And so there's two choices you can look at here. That he's pressing on us and he's getting our sinful nature up into the wind and blowing it away, right? That's a good thought. That uh, as we study the Bible and as we learn to uh, rejoice in the law of the Lord, he's working on our lives trying to get rid of the, the sinful nature. Uh, the other thought, which is what most people believe, is that he goes to his church and he takes his winnowing fork and he throws us all up into the air. And those who love Jesus and want to be like Jesus are going to come back down. And all the fake disciples who are just faking it are going to be blown out and burned up with the chaff. And so those are the two thoughts. Um, and so either way, we have time today to make a change in our thought process to want to love like Jesus, to rejoice in the law of the Lord, to be happy by bearing fruit, to meditate on his law all the day and the night, because our God, our Father, today is his day, and we celebrate his day. And so we celebrate today, but we celebrate every day. We celebrate always, because he is our Father. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so I want to challenge you guys, get into the word of God, share your faith with the scariest person and keep it going and, uh, and let the Bible penetrate you to get rid of the chaff in your life so that you're found to be pure and like Jesus. And so let's celebrate God always. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for such a powerful sermon. Let's all stay to our feet and truly rejoice in our Lord. Flip to song 109 in your songbook. So we're going to have the sisters start us off first. So sopranos, then altos. Got it? 109 in your songbooks. Ready? And
Thank you. 